Good morning. And welcome to this, the third Sunday in the season of Easter, sometimes called Easter Tide. Welcome to this service of worship with Blur Street United Church, gathering among ourselves, led by members of the transition team, together with myself, Douglas Ducharme, Mikey Zahorek, and our choristers. We planned this together as a way to invite the whole Bloor Street community, both here and on Zoom, into our transition journey. Not as a way of going from place to place, getting to our destination, but recognizing that this is an in-between time that is itself rich and fertile with insights, key moments of discernment and new awareness. It's a time that will draw on our diversity as a community of faith, weaving together our different questions, our different experiences and identities, our differing degrees of faith commitment, our uncertainty, our creativity, our tears, and our laughter. Each of you brings a unique perspective and spirit to today's gathering, enriching our collective experience. And for that reason alone, I'm especially glad that we are gathering together here today, enriching our collective experience by sharing among one another. I'm really glad you're here. The transition team, including me, appreciate your presence and your participation in this journey together, and we're extremely grateful, especially to Alia Almansi, who is hosting Zoom Church today and then is going above and beyond to facilitate the Zoom table for this table group discussion that will follow for us downstairs with lunch. So let's begin. Our gathering today is in two parts. In the first part, here in this worship space, we will explore together the story of an encounter with the, the risen Jesus on a road that ends with a simple meal. We will do this through words and music, prayer and song, and we'll drop in a few questions as we go. Seeds for the second part, conversations to follow after a community lunch. As Douglas said, transition times are creative and fertile moments that gradually come to life in response to changes that have already happened. We have experienced a lot of those. COVID brought tremendous uncertainty and risk to us all. During that time, we moved out of our historic building at the corner of Bloor and Huron. We said goodbye to our long time and much loved minister and welcomed a new minister with openness and trust. We lived into a relationship, we lived into a relationship with St. Matthews United that has enriched us. And then we said goodbye to a minister who we had only begun to know. Through that time, children were born, grandchildren grew up, family members moved away, and we lost friends and family who died. We used to talk about being on a camping trip. That implied we intentionally left our home and were on a journey somewhere else, and that we'd eventually return home. But we're not there yet. So here we are in a place of in-between and of opportunity. This threshold invites us to take time time to heal, to wonder what if, to learn about ourselves, time to confront our fears and challenges, and to discern new ways of being a faith community in urban downtown 21st century Toronto. 
This is not a time for strategic planning, though we will make plans. Our journey is not so much a focus on our future church home. It's more about determining who we are and what our purpose is once we are in your new building. Ultimately, it's about how we use this in-between time to discern how we want to be when we eventually get there. Arriving refreshed, renewed and ready. Now is a time for nurturing deep conversations and deep listening about the things that matter to us, to the world, and to God. Through worship and table conversation, together we are on our way, and we're not alone. As we gather here in this holy place, we recognize that for thousands of years, this land has been a sacred gathering place for many people of Turtle Island. And we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of several indigenous nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, and the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples and that this is now a home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, right here where we're building our new church. The original nations continue to cry out for justice, and we continue to work to restore those right relations. As a people, we continue to listen, learn, and work to correct the wrongs of the past and the present. In this Easter tide, this continuing season of Easter, as we read stories of profound encounters that Jesus' friends and followers had with what they knew to be him, but in an entirely new way, we are invited to hold on to those times when we too have had a sense of that living presence in our world sometimes through others, sometimes within ourselves. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. I invite you to join me in our words of the call to worship. We who are a thirsty people come to the source, the spring that will not dry up. We bring our thirst here to be quenched. When we are weary, the spirit is a ready refuge. We may find rest. When we're lost, come to the one who knows the way. Lead us by the hand, by our hearts, and by our hope. Psalm 30 frames the struggles of life and faith within the steady presence of God. The psalmist begins with a shout of praise. God has drawn them up, healed them, and restored them to life. Even so, places of chaos and meaninglessness pressed against those who seek to flourish in the life. This prosperity, it is so easy to affirm our steadfast faith in prosperity. However, the psalmist Riley observes, when life becomes a struggle, we fear God is absent, yet God turns weeping into laughter. As he says, as the psalmist says, I will extol you, O God, for you have lifted me up. You have not let my enemies triumph over me. O God, my God, I cried to you for help, and you restored my health. You brought me back from the dead. You saved my life as I was going down to the grave. Let all your servants sing praises to you 
and give thanks to your holy name. Your anger is but for a moment, but your kindness is life eternal. In my prosperity, I said, I shall never be shaken. Your favor, O oh God, has made me as firm as any strong mountain. You turned your face away from me, and I was greatly dismayed. I called you. I made my appeal. What profit is there in my death, in my going down to the grave? Will the dust give you praise? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O oh God, and be gracious to me. O oh God, be my helper. You turned my mourning into dancing. You stripped off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my heart will sing your praise without ceasing. O oh God, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. This morning's Gospel reading is taken from Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. The Gospel of Luke takes us on a road frequently, and as Luke nears its end, we're on the road again, this time with two despondent disciples on the road to the town of Emmaus, just outside of Jerusalem, on Easter day in the morning, in the evening. The story weaves together irony, misunderstanding, drama, and then a reveal. Also familiar themes in Luke appear. Table fellowship, hospitality, faithfulness, and discipleship. This scene sets up the future of the church that Luke will continue in Acts. A church on the move, sent out by a Jesus who walks alongside us even when we don't recognize him. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on the journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place there over the last few days? He said to them, what things? They said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago, but there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he is alive. 
Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women said. They didn't see him. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going on ahead. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at the table with him, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, Weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road? and when he explained the scriptures for us. They didn't waste a minute. They were up and on their way back to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their friends gathered together, talking away. It really happened. The master has been raised up. Simon saw him. Then the two went over everything that had happened on the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. In this reading, we hear God's voice. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. So these two are not among the ones we're used to hearing about, the Peters and the Johns and the Jameses and the others in clo Jesus' close circle of friends and followers. But they have been a part of it. They, too, gave themselves over to this dynamic and hope filled but risky venture, this man, Jesus. And now they're dejected, they're dispirited, so much so that they don't even want to be with the others anymore in their shared grief at the end of this long and disorienting and heartbreaking day that we call Easter. So they're walking home. Maybe it's all they could think of to do. There's something about roads in Luke, as Mary Louise said. He takes us on a lot of roads, both literally and metaphorically. They fit with the author's experience of the followers of Jesus in Luke and then in Acts as a people on the move as Jesus, too, was always on the move. But this is no pilgrimage, planned ahead, eagerly anticipated. These two, one named Cleopas, the other unnamed, are walking with the slow steps of bewilderment and grief. The world as they knew it, all they'd set their hopes on, has been wrenched apart by the violent death of the one in whom they'd invested their lives. Jesus meets them there on the way. He doesn't ask them to undertake some holy trek or enact some pious feat. He meets them where they are on the road, in the midst of their journey, right smack in the middle of all the pain, the frustration, the despondency that threatens to overwhelm them, even though they don't recognize him. If we're honest, this is where a lot of us are, or certainly have been, somewhere in between emptiness and abundance, between disillusionment and acceptance, between dashed hopes and fulfillment. We know this betweenness, and it's not an easy place to be. What happens is that Jesus shows up. 
not in the easy way that people reassure you of when you're bereft and uprooted that Jesus will always be with you. I don't doubt that that's true. But what exactly does Jesus do when he shows up? He sabotages my words. and interrupts their conversation and their sermon. Well, he doesn't just join them on the way. He gets them to articulate what they've experienced. What things, asks Jesus, and their response is dismissive. Where have you been these last few days, living under a rock? And yet the question leads them to describe the things to name the hurt, to speak their truth, to name the doubt, and they're honest about it. We had hoped, they say, which have to be three of the saddest words in the Bible. We had hoped. That's what Jesus does, not just show up, but show up and give us the opportunity to speak the truth of our predicament, to help us make sense of it all, or at least some of it, to help us get to a place where we can see beyond what is happening, so we can move from we had hoped to hearts on fire which means that the road actually gets us somewhere. And that somewhere eventually is a place where we recognize and begin, begin to live out the life-changing presence of the resurrected one, the living one in the world. Notice though that Jesus appears along the road as a stranger someone encountered along the way, like the people in our daily round of work and shopping and going to the dentist and riding the subway and going to the gym. And it's why the ancient rabbis would say that the two greatest commandments, love of God and love of neighbor, are really one, one commandment because it is in knowing and loving our neighbor that we encounter God. As we join with others in weaving healing and life in the world that God so, so loves. This is why the work of the transition team, the work of all of us in this time, will return again and again to just three questions. Who are we? Why are we here? And who is our neighbor? We discover the paradox of the Holy One who is both the stranger and our companion. As St. Augustine put it over 1700 years ago, the teacher was walking with them along the way. And he himself was the way their journey that day, unlike ours, does have a fixed destination. Or at least they thought it did, but let's not get ahead of ourselves in the story. As they near Emmaus, the two friends notice that Jesus seems intent to keep walking. That day, and it, it has been a long day, is nearly done. Walking at night is dangerous. They press on upon their walking companion to stay with them. They offer hospitality and, and he agrees. Finally, they open the door and he goes in, stepping over the, house, uh, the threshold into their home. But as soon as the table is set, Jesus upends the expected social roles, the protocols. He who in the Gospels is always the guest becomes the host by blessing the bread 
and sharing it. And when Jesus does that most Jesus thing of all, everything changes. When he does that thing, that thing he does, and what is it? Breaking and blessing bread to share. Jesus is most Jesus at an everyday simple table, an ordinary meal, transformed because of the people gathered and the sharing. And what happens then? The Brazilian theologian Ruben Alves has written that words and food are made out of the same stuff. Both are born of the same mother, hunger. Words and food are both born of the same mother, hunger. For around a table, food is shared, not hoarded. Friendships are made, relationships strengthened, and the sharing and the interaction guides us toward new horizons, new visions for this world that God loves. Something happens. Jesus, the risen one, leaves. And the presumed destination of the two friends that day gets upended as exhausted as they are, they run back to their friends in Jerusalem. When they invited their road companion through the doorway into their home, as they stepped across the familiar threshold, they did not know the transformation, the renewal that was in store. But by the time they but by the time they follow him back out the door, everything has changed. And today, everything still changes on the thresholds we cross over. Hi. So, Douglas, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, the story you describe is, is beautiful, it really is. Mm. Um, it, those human emotions, um, you know, the fact that they realize our hearts were on fire. Um, it, it, they, they see their own transformation, it's, it's wonderful. But, but that story is also 2,000 years old. Mm. And, and, and I'm hoping you can connect us with the story a bit more today. Uh, Cleopas and his friend, they were focused very much on, on one heartbreaking frame of reference, mm. that, 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 that tragedy that happened to their friend and their teacher in Jerusalem. And, and today we're in the 21st century and, and we, have, we have a constant sense of the global big picture. So, so we receive a huge amount of information we, we know about today's current events. We know about the wars and the famines um, and uh, the, the, the climate crisis, the rising inequality. We feel all kinds of background anxieties and crises and, and it's a drumbeat from all directions and, and our own challenges here in our congregation. And that's what we're here to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. um, so more than ever, we're, we're looking for comfort and, and reassurance, and, um, and so we're hoping to see more of a connection. Thank you for holding on to your thoughts for a moment. I really needed the music to hear that hope. Sometimes it seems so far, sometimes so near, come join together, take the dusty road. Help one another, share the heavy load, the journey may be long, but if you'll take my hand, We'll walk together toward the land of freedom. Freedom. So tell me more about what you were asking. Well, you don't want to just conclude with what we... <laughs> no, I think we need to dig deeper. I think we need to dig a little more. Well, yeah. it's, yeah, I mean, it would be lovely to just conclude with that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what can be more beautiful than John Rutter? And, 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 and I mean, I remember that time of transformation. We all do, you know, when the, when the Berlin Wall came down and, 
and, and Nelson Mandela freed after 27 years, and, and we, were, we were watching the arc of history bend toward justice. That's the way it seemed anyway, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but you know, for us here today, and, and for Bloor Streeters, we're, we're feeling different emotions, and, and mm -hmm. you've asked, mm -hmm. so, so I'll, I'll say. I mean it, yeah, <laughs> let's, let's hear. So, I mean, I, I feel myself, I feel a tiredness. And, and Bloor Street's most committed volunteers, they're, they're speaking of tiredness, too. We've, we've become a smaller group over time. And, and we don't feel up to the tasks that we've set ourselves, and, and we, we don't feel up to the expectations that, that we've had for a long time. And, and just for in, as an example, you know, we, we, we ask ourselves, how well are we caring for each other? Mm. Um, how are we doing on pastoral care, on, on, on keeping up with each other uh, mm -hmm. in, in good times and in bad? And, and COVID made that harder for everybody, but, but it hasn't gotten easier, and we're all getting older. Or, or if you think about our social justice projects, and, and those have been a real badge of honor for us over the years, and, and for United Church all over. And we have to look around and say, well, those, those nonprofits with staff, they're they're really doing a, a, you know, a good, effective job. They're professional, and, and what can we add, you know? It, it's true. And, and then if you look at our Bloor Street financial picture, um, long term, so we have a generous revenue that's going to come from the new building, mm -hmm. but we're going to have lots of expenses too. Mm -hmm. and, and so this idea of having deficits long term, if we keep on the current path, that's, that's very unsettling, you mm -hmm. know? It is. So, so all of that is, is, is overwhelming and it's, it's a bit paralyzing. Mm. And then at the same time, there's this, this real urgency. Um, mm. You know, we're very lucky to have you, Douglas. I really feel that, you know, you're a specialized interim minister, and, and we see how you're coaching us, how you're, you're, you're giving us new ways of having conversations. You're helping us see potential that we haven't, you know, noticed before. But we also know that you're only here for a short time. You know, was it two years, something like that? So then, you know, we really need to start thinking about what are our ministerial needs longer term. Yeah. And, yeah. and that takes, it's a big process, and, and we need to figure out when, when does that fit in. And, and finally, and it's, it's really a big one, is we need to move into our new building. Oh, yeah. And, and that's, <laughs> that's a really big thing. Um, we need to take ownership of it, you know, we, we want to, and just not just run the building, but mm -hmm. we want to have a presence there. We want our neighbors to yeah. realize who we are. We want to have a plan. Mm. Um, we want to connect and, and be relevant somehow. And, and so that's coming up fast. And, and I'll, that's a lot, so that I'll just is. leave it at that. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, that's exactly what happened on the road. And I was just talking about, too, I, I, I noticed the, Jesus met them where they were and, they, and he asked them about what was going on that was most important to them right then and they, and they told him. They told him about the confusion and the hopes, the fears, the losses and the people they cared about. They, they, they were all, all on their hearts and maybe that's what we can do is talk about the things that matter, that really deeply matter to us, and take advantage of this time in between and while I am here and whatever I can do to encourage and resource and reassure along the way that this is a time for deep conversations and deep listening, especially over food. <laughs> we have a couple of other things that we need to get here today, but we, we could start right now pretty much because we have this we have this and we have this ministry we do and we're not alone thanks Ellen.
Springtime is for planting, one of those everyday expressions of great faith. We plant seeds and water and weed them and expect a harvest of, I don't know, zinnias and zucchini. We plant an acorn and we marvel at the size of the eventual oak tree. But we do that planting. The seeds are the seeds of our time, our commitment, our resources, financial and human and creative. And, and here at Bloor Street, in many, many different ways, what we cultivate is transformation. There are offering plates where you can place your offering today, and many of us are on a pre-authorized giving plan. Those offerings of yourself and everything you give is blessed as those seeds grow and give life. Amen. I'm there to back you up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let us affirm our faith by re standing and repeating together our United Church Creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, to work in us and our spirits. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to separate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our church and our hope, in life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Ground of all being, Mother of life, Father of the universe, your name is sacred beyond speaking. May we know your presence. May your longings be our longings in heart and in action. May there be food for the human family today and for the whole Christ community. Forgive us the souls and the what we have done, and we forgive the those who are coming through to us. Do not, not forsake us in the time of conflict, but lead us into new beginnings. For the light of life, the power of life, and, and the glory of life are yours, now and forever. Amen. As some of you will have heard this week, Remit 1 has passed overwhelmingly. A significant step, I would say, for this United Church of ours. Remit 1 is concerned with establishing an autonomous national indigenous organization within the United Church of Canada. When our congregation met, we had some discussion and we voted in favor of this. Our vote went in among many, many others, and it is approved. The voting process engaged many of us right across the church in in-depth and, in some cases, challenging conversations about right relations with Indigenous peoples in this church. Throughout this process, it became clear that there is need for deeper and ongoing work to address the issues of systemic racism which persist in our church. Despite our commitment to reconciliation, we will be engaging in this important work this coming year and onwards. The 44th General Council will be asked to enact the remit at its annual meeting on October 19th this year. And now that the re voting results are in, it's time for us to travel together in a new way. God will be with us as we support one another's journeys.
Brothers, sisters, clergy, lay, called to service by your grace. Different cultures, different gifts, the young and old, a place. We have this ministry. O oh God, receive our giving, our loving, our living. In that spirit, we will now simply move our gathering downstairs and resume at table there where we will share in food and conversation about our life together as Blur Street. The ministry we do together, not just me, not just the transition team or council or staff, we have this ministry. So let's see how it brings us together and inspires us anew, beginning with words of blessing. The world now is too dangerous and too beautiful for anything but love. May your eyes be so blessed you see God in everyone. Your ears so you hear the cry of the poor. May your hands be so blessed that everything you touch is a sacrament. Your lips so you speak nothing but the truth with love. May your feet be so blessed that you run to those who need you. And may your heart be so opened, so set on fire, that your love, your love changes everything. Go in peace.